Big news today, friends. I have a new camera body to show you. You have probably heard of Sigma's lenses. I've reviewed a number of them on this channel and I even own a handful of them for my L-mount camera bodies back there. But today, Sigma announced a new camera body, the FPL. I have been using this borrowed pre-production unit along with the brand new optical viewfinder for a couple of weeks now. And I'm excited to share my experience with you today. But before we jump into this camera, if you are new here, hello, my name is Lee. I make videos every week on all things photography and anything where you might have a camera in your hand. That might be gear reviews like today, or it might be inspiration or technique or art topics. I just recently released my completed full course on landscape photography. It is over three hours of video learning and it is available to my members. If you'd like to learn more about this and my other courses or the benefits that members receive, click the link in the description to learn more about channel membership. I reviewed the Sigma FP, the FPL's sibling last year, and I was surprised to see how many people were enthusiastic about it. The FP seemed like a camera that didn't get a ton of press, but it apparently hit a home run for a lot of people. While the FP will remain in the lineup, this newer FPL will be a compelling option for those same people, but there are a couple of important updates on this body that may make this interesting to a lot more people. I got to know the camera a bit at home. I went through the menus and set everything the way that I like it, like my photo and video settings, as well as changing some of the functions of some of the buttons, but then I took it out for a long and beautiful sunrise hike in Sedona, Arizona. We'll come back to those photos and videos, but let's take a look at the body itself. If you are familiar with the FP, you'll recognize the FPL. The body is nearly identical. All of the same accessories will work. Along with the new EVF-11, the add-on electronic viewfinder, this was a big deal for me. I typically prefer to have a viewfinder, so the addition of this to the lineup, you'll be able to use it with both the FP and the FPL, by the way, which is amazing for current FP owners. It makes this camera something that I could use on a daily basis. Because the camera has a fixed LCD screen, the tilting EVF made low angle shots still doable for me. And speaking of usability, let's get into that. This system reminds me of Lego, and I happen to love Lego. 
What I mean by that is that the FP system is modular. There are a bunch of accessories you can add on or take away to suit your purpose that day. I've already mentioned the electronic viewfinder, but you can also attach a grip, which while small is deceptively useful because you can kind of tuck the pads of your fingers behind it. I found it very secure. There is actually also a larger hand grip if this one doesn't work for you. There is a hot shoe attachment. You can add these eyelets for a strap, and there are any number of brackets or gimbals that you could use with this tiny little body. Like I said, it's able to transform, to be suited to different uses. When I used the FP last year, I used it with a bunch of different lenses, but I did use it alone with one of Sigma's i-series prime lenses like this one for a walk around the museum, like no grip or anything. And it was really nice to have a compact camera that could easily just tuck away when I wasn't using it. Or with the FPL when I was hiking, I attached the EVF and the grip. I hung the rig on a strap around my neck and this was actually really important. It simply felt and behaved like a traditional DSLR or mirrorless interchangeable lens body. I didn't think twice about the fact that I had screwed the EVF, the grip, and the eyelets on before I left the house. For me, with the amount of hiking and such that I do with my cameras, that is a very notable point. Beyond the flexibility of the physical form factor, it's small and lightweight. It's dust and splash proof with an aluminum die cast body, which is not only durable, but in combination with the large heat sink that's integrated into it, means that it is very difficult to overheat the camera. It has room for one UHS-2 SD card, or you can record to a portable SSD via USB. And speaking of USB, you can also charge the camera via USB-C while using the camera. This is nice for time lapse or when you want to shoot a lot of video or when you're using this camera as a webcam. One more note about the body. Sigma has managed to include quite a few buttons, dials, and switches. As I mentioned earlier, I did make use of the ability to change the function of some of the buttons and I found the switches incredibly useful. It made making certain changes like going from stills mode to scene mode just easier. I could do it without looking at the camera. And something else that sounds like a small thing but is actually impactful is the rear wheel. The camera lacks a rear command dial, so you turn this wheel to adjust exposure or exposure compensation depending on what mode you're using. I typically dislike this type of control because I wind up pressing the four-way buttons as I'm turning the wheel. But this wheel is constructed differently. I did not have trouble with it, which for me is unheard of. When I review gear, I always spend a lot of time on the actual usability of the camera because anyone can look at a spec sheet and talk about what the individual specifications may do. But that's not real life. The actual usability of the camera has to support the specifications inside, or those specs just don't really matter. Getting into those specs though, let's start with the mount. This is an L-mount body. If you keep up with camera news, you may know about the L-mount Alliance, which is among Sigma, Leica, and Panasonic. They each have L-mount bodies and lenses, so you can use any of the L-mount lenses from any of the three brands on the L-mount bodies from any of the three brands. And this includes the Sigma FPL. During my time with this camera, I ended up only actually using two lenses, the new Sigma 28 to 70 millimeter F2.8 DGDN Contemporary and my Panasonic 70 to 200 F4 lens. That being said, after having used the camera and edited the photos and video, I'd feel comfortable using any lens on it, including the compact Sigma I series lenses like this one, or even the Leica lenses or the Sigma art lenses. Moving on to the sensor. This camera has a full frame 61 megapixel back illuminated bare sensor with a low pass filter to preserve optical performance. And I can attest to the quality of the images. They are absolutely wonderful. There's something about Sigma's color science that I enjoy, which allows me to just spend less time at the computer when editing. There is no in-body image stabilization, though there is electronic stabilization that you can turn on in certain modes, which I did do when shooting handheld video. It isn't available in all video frame rates, but I used it with success. 
I also made use of the optical stabilization in the Panasonic 70 to 200 millimeter lens to shoot some video handheld. IBIS is definitely something that I prefer in a camera because I do quite a bit of handheld video, but I can't say I really missed it here. Also, this camera is small and lightweight enough that you can use the smaller electronic gimbals that are on the market. Since we are on the topic of video, there are a variety of resolutions, frame rates, and bit rates, which I'll put up on the screen right now. I chose 8-bit 4K 30p and sometimes 1080 120p writing to the card in the field, but I did do a quick test in my office to confirm that you can capture 1080 60p 12-bit cinema DNG footage to the memory card, which is pretty amazing. Rounding out the discussion on video, though these things are actually available for stills, but I found them especially helpful for video. You have options to customize how your footage looks, like the tone curve and color modes. I elected to use Vivid when I was in Sedona, but these color modes can certainly be useful in filmmaking to create a mood. There are even a couple of new colors on this camera, Duotone and Powder Blue. Finally getting to image quality. It is very good for a few reasons. First, the high megapixel sensor allows you to crop quite a lot and retain clarity. As a side note, you can use the crop mode in the camera in both stills and video. In video, it will even retain the resolution you've chosen. Having a crop mode isn't exactly groundbreaking, but I do appreciate that you actually have options beyond just full frame and APS-C. As for speed, I wouldn't put this camera in the category of a dedicated sports camera, but it will capture stills in high speed at up to 10 frames per second and in medium speed at up to five frames per second. And there is a new hybrid autofocus system. The FPL has both phase detect and contrast detect where the original FP has contrast detect only. Now, this is a pre-production unit with pre-production firmware, so I can't go in depth on the continuous autofocus or the tracking. That was one of the things that Sigma was still working on but I can say that I have used the camera extensively in AFS and single point autofocus, and the camera focuses quickly and reliably. I was impressed with focusing in low contrast areas, especially when I was capturing the backlit balloons. I also tried continuous autofocus during video with face and eye detect on. And while this is a part of the camera's functionality that Sigma warned me wasn't quite complete yet, I was actually impressed with this particular clip where I was focused on the plants, but when I came into the scene, it focused on me pretty quickly, but also incredibly smoothly. It wasn't jarring at all, which to me leads to more aesthetically pleasing footage. Now for my favorite surprise in my time with the camera, the 16-bit RAW files. I was in a challenging environment with the sun cresting the mountains and the balloons in shadow. Take this photo for instance. When I pulled it up on my computer, I fully expected that the highlights were lost. I actually sat there and kicked myself for managing to overexpose this one because this one was my favorite composition of the series. But alas, here is my edited image. I am absolutely blown away by the highlight recovery. I have not seen that kind of latitude in anything other than medium format sensors. And for me, being outside with my camera a whole lot, the benefit of this can't be understated. Looking at lower light situations, this video was captured at ISO 6400. It was before sunrise and was still quite dark. I was actually just barely able to navigate the trail without my headlamp on. And the quality of this video is still superb. There are a number of features that seem like they'll be helpful, though I didn't get a chance to use them. One of them is this camera behaving as a director's viewfinder with different cinema camera or custom frame lines. And you can capture settings a couple of different ways. You can save and then share settings with a QR code. And you can also take a screenshot of the camera's LCD screen, which records the settings. If you are using the camera as a director's viewfinder, or if you are using multiple FPLs for filming, these can be really helpful. And maybe more importantly, they can save you time. <laughs> And like I said earlier, I don't have the final production firmware to test the autofocus in terms of continuous autofocus or AI. So overall, I have been incredibly impressed with this camera. The highlight recovery alone is astonishing. 
if I could magically change anything about this camera, it would be to add a joystick to move the focus area around the frame. You can use the touch screen to choose a focus area and it works really well, but when you're using the EVF, you have to do two button presses in order to activate the directional pad on the back to move the focus area around. But that's personal preference and mainly has to do with my impatience. I certainly worked around it. In fact, I did thoroughly enjoy using this on the hike. Let's talk cost and availability. In the US, body only is $24.99 and the EVF 11 is $6.99, but you can purchase the bundle at a discount for $29.99. It's all expected to be available mid-April this year. What do you think? Do you own the FP? What do you think of this new FPL? Let us know in the comments. I will link to this camera in the description so you can learn more and any of the lenses and anything I used. And remember, there is also a link to learn more about channel membership if you are interested in my complete courses. And I'll throw a link down there to my gear reviews playlist in case you want to check out some of my other L-mount reviews. Please give this video a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you to Sigma for trusting me with this tiny bundle of joy. And thank you for watching.